Hello, hello. Welcome, Welcome everybody. everybody. Welcome, Welcome to our, our first talk, talk show. show. I'm just checking in if you can see me live. And if we are clearly audible and uh, you can just, uh, you know, hear us in a clear way. I'm Dr. Shivani Sood. I'm the founder of Shivani Ayurveda. And today with me, I have the beautiful Gail. And we are in our first episode of Thursday Health Talks. So I'm just tuning in to see if I'm live and if everything is good because sometimes I've seen that, you know, we are doing the live and we're just missing from the place. Hello, Gail. Welcome to our first chat show. Hello. Good morning, Shivani. Or good morning from the UK. It may be a different time there with you. So hi to everyone out there. Hello. So in today's episode, we are going to learn exactly how to use Ayurveda in the modern lifestyle. And uh, in this fundamental health talk, you will understand that uh, what changes you can bring in your life to start to make your health better. The channel is a verified place of Ayurvedic consultants and practitioners who are, you know, bringing in accurate information, which is highly practical. So like and subscribe to our channel so that you can follow all our chat shows. So. Welcome, Gail, and uh, let's say, like, uh, how are you doing today, and how's the weather in UK? I'm great, thank you, Shivani. But you know, um, I'm in the UK, and we can have all four seasons in one day. So um, it's usually either too wet, too cold, too windy, sometimes too hot, too sunny, um, or too bright. You know, it's our national obsession the weather because it changes so much. So let's just say it's just after 9 a.m. here this morning. And we've already had spring, autumn and winter. <laughs> so I'm <laughs> living a little bit of sunshine, a little bit of summer. Um, but it is October, so I'm not holding my breath. So how is it over there in Durham Shalom? Oh, Durham Shalom is having fabulous sunny autumn. <laughs> oh, I'm so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, you know, today we are here together to inspire people to bring changes in their life. And first thing what I would like to ask you, because you're based in UK and you're a Chopra wellness teacher and professional Ayurvedic consultant, meditation teacher, and you have grown over the era of, you know, as you were changing your profession and bringing in lots of new things, I would like to ask you this question. What majorly do you see has changed, you know, in the times which was not there in the past? What has changed in the times? That's interesting, Shivani. You know, I mean, Ayurvedically speaking, you know, our modern life would be absolutely unrecognizable to those wise ancient sages that laid the foundations of Ayurveda, obviously, you know, because historically, you know, we ate local, fresh, seasonal, unprocessed foods. Uh, we didn't smoke or drink alcohol. We went to bed when the sun did, and we woke with the sun the next morning, you know. So we lived in sync with the seasons and with the body's circadian rhythms. I mean, we were probably a darn sight healthier then. I'm sure we were, most of us, than we are now. I think also we had more time for relationships. And I've even noticed this within my lifetime. Yeah. You know, with our partners, with our parents, with our children. Yeah. yeah. And I think even if I go back to my parents' generation, the mm -hmm. defined hierarchies of class and gender, unfair as they were, they meant that most people knew their role in life. And, you know, they kind of, they knew where they fitted in the power structure. There wasn't all the uncertainty and confusion and they kind of stressed about to get ahead, I don't think, in quite the same way. And I'm not wishing to suggest it was idyllic back then. It wasn't at all. You know, equalities and injustices have always existed. But it would have been easier, I think, to live by defined traditional Ayurvedic principles in the past. Right. And now that's a bit of a struggle for us, of course. Right. Because if you think about it, you know, pre the Industrial Revolution, I'd just like to point out that's well before my time, um, you know, the planet was less polluted, obviously. The air we breathed and the water we drank were cleaner. We were consuming fewer toxins. Our food was grown naturally. And even our medicinal herbs were probably a lot more potent then than they It was. Now. Yes, it was. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the technical, technological advances we've made, you know, from the mid-19th century have been amazing. But sadly, they've introduced new sources of air and water pollution. So Definitely. by the middle of the 20th yes. century, you know, chemical pollutants had added to the problem and the effects of those changes were beginning to be felt in countries around the world. You know, we all remember the issues of DDT in the 60s and, you know, damaged children and um, some of the drugs that have, we've used in our societies that have damaged children, damaged the unborn. 
So I think in the last 50 years, we've also moved closer to a 24-7 lifestyle, you know, we're always on. Yeah. And I think we need to pull ourselves away from that. You know, we need to actually make a bit of an intervention. And yeah. I think that's we have so much to offer in terms of modern Ayurvedic practices to help people, you know, Definitely. draw away a little bit, reconnect yeah. with themselves. I think that's really important. That's, that's beautifully, beautifully said. said. Because, you know, the relationship changing and what you said about the technology has really bring in so much change in human beings. Nowadays, I only listen to parents complaining that their children are in front of the phone and on their iPads and tablets. I mean, we didn't have all of this before. We just were playing outside and meeting friends and uh, everything has become so digital. I mean, there's perks. It's a completely new era, right, for Ayurveda. Absolutely totally is you know um you know and I, I know you're even seeing this in in the east you know it's happening yeah. in india it's not just as here it in the is, west yeah, maybe it is. been going on longer for us in the west mm -hmm. you know i think possibly though even now ayurvedic principles are more easily understood and applied in india i suspect because even by the young because although you might not know why you follow a certain practice you know, maybe your granny puts the water in a copper pot overnight or whatever it is for the next day. You know, little things and little habits and practices, the traditional practices have gone on. And that's because, of course, that Vedic lifestyle is so embedded in, in the culture. And, you know, for yeah. example, you know, your great grandmother did it. Um, she taught your grandmother. Your grandmother then taught your mother. Your mother taught you almost without you even realizing you're learning certain things. And on it exactly. goes to Yeah, you know, it does. And I think right. globally, I'm delighted to say these lifestyle practices are being validated by good science. Right. Some of those things that people have done traditionally are really being, you know, now being validated. There are a multitude of peer-reviewed research papers from very highly, you know, respected institutions all over the world, not, not in India necessarily, in America, Europe, etc. And they show how and why those practices work. So it really has been validated. And, you know, I think I'm really delighted that these Ayurvedic principles have spread to the West and we can all benefit. Definitely. We are. I know my, I benefit, my family benefit from it. My, my clients do, my friends do. I make sure I spread the word wherever I go and I know you do. But, you know, I know, Shivani, you trained to become an Ayurvedic doctor in India and right. you've, got, you know, you've, you've established a very highly regarded practice there. But you've traveled and taught internationally and I know you spent a lot of time in the US and in Europe You've been yeah. presenting, lecturing, you're consulting. So, you know, tell me, how challenging was it making that geographical and cultural transition from taking that from the East into the West? Right. right. So, so yes, yes, I have trained in India as a Ayurvedic doctor and I, when I did not start traveling, I was totally in a different sphere. Well, I set up my practice in Dharamshala and it's quite an international destination where people from all over the world come. And that's when I started to realize that those were those people, when I started to do my consultations, are eating completely different than what we do in India. You know, that was my first thing. They were talking about things I did not know. So then I started looking at practitioners, you know, who were working in the West, Dr. Vasant La, Dr. David Trolley, you know, the ones who are very popular, right? And, uh, right. Right. So I, I started looking at them and I saw that there was a completely different world out there. And that's why I started to travel in 2006. And uh, with my very first experience of being in the West, like uh, I was always a person who was very interested to learn about culture. So when I took my Ayurveda there, I was interested in people rather than, you know, wishing for them to follow my Ayurveda. And it was a completely different life over there. I mean, life in India also became very modern in the last 15 years. But back those in 2006, there was a completely different way of cooking. I remember being invited to a place for dinner and the host didn't cook anything. Right. And I was very surprised because, you know, in India, when guests come, we are always having a lot of cooking there and people are preparing. And I'm like, where's the food? Because I thought maybe it's put it in the refrigerator. But the truth, he did not cook anything. And I thought, like, how is he going to feed us dinner? Because he just opened up a bottle of wine and, you know, we're waiting for the dinner. And dinner was just 10 minutes. Yeah, he boiled spinach, he boiled some spaghetti, put some cottage cheese over the spaghetti. There you go, dinner's ready. So it was very surprising the way people met, you know, even the partnership, parenting. 
and there was everything in the west but i felt like there was a lot of pressure you know this was my first meeting of the west the high pressure there to perform to be perfect and uh, i remember in my clinic the employees who are indian and once we you know had a client and my therapist uh, was asking me why she's crying after we were doing a panchakarma procedure vomiting why is she crying after this and i said to her well she's bulimic and so she has a very emotional connection with vomiting she's not seeing this as you know cleaning her lungs she is seeing it as bulimia and she said what is bulimia you know and i said well <laughs> this is the thing in india they don't even what's a bulimia right in the west there were so many of eating disorders body image disorders you know so the contentment towards yourself and to be kinder towards yourself and the pressure to make the right decision you know like time is ticking i should have a baby or i should have a partner so you know it completely changed me the traveling experience and i understood that if you know i want i would rather to work more efficiently for them then i need to understand them rather than painting them with all the things i knew and that's where consultancy came in yeah like to just to listen you know what's important for them what means for them their tradition also had beautiful practices you know which they had forgotten because it's not only indian i whether every country has beautiful traditional practices so overall the growth happened in my personality to kind of really see this that the world is different but we all need we all need in the end a good guidelines for living our life in a more better way to have this quality of you know how we feel inside us to have this smile on our face you know to feel excited about things so that's where you know in spite of west being very different we all wanted the same thing right happiness peace health and just listening changed everything so that's that's my little story about you know meeting the east meeting the west and uh, I would like to ask you Gail but uh, let let's start explaining now what ayurveda for modern lifestyle means and how it's different from traditional ayurveda because many people ask uh, are you really going to change ayurveda you know are you going to you know bring in a new ayurveda or you know what is this what you are doing with the modern uh, lifestyle and the modern ayurveda so let's bring into light Well, do you know, I, Shivani, it was so interesting what you're saying about the individual, you know, the focus on the individual, because I think in, in our modern society, individuals are very different in a way they, there probably wasn't that degree of difference between individuals historically. You know, we are so very different, east to west, different nationalities, different um, genders, different age groups. You know, we've had very different experiences, it's been a very different, the pace of life has been very different, we've evolved differently. You know, and Ayurveda has been around for thousands of years, and it was considered to be the best way to treat disease and maintain a healthy lifestyle. You know, in ancient India, of course. And traditional Ayurveda is an amazing healthcare and lifestyle system. <clears throat> It suits a traditional lifestyle, though, doesn't it? You know, right, you have to be living right. like a lifestyle. And as you just said, your host in in the U.S. didn't cook, whereas <laughs> in India. you know mum would be in the kitchen she'd have done breakfast and the first thing she was doing was thinking about lunch and then yeah. thinking about dinner you know it was very different then the convenience foods weren't there and so on and women weren't out working either so you know life has changed an awful lot um however relatively few of us now live by those traditional lifestyle principles so i think what we have to realize is when we talk about um ayurveda for modern lifestyle we're not talking about diluting it we're not talking about shortcuts necessarily or or damaging shortcuts we're talking about adaptation right. adapting to our lifestyle that's really what it's all about you know we know we can't turn the clock back but right. you know what we can do we can adapt those healing wisdom traditions of ayurveda to suit our modern lifestyle and that's what essentially we do it's what we've right. been working on this evening all of us and all of your consultants have been doing this and then using those practices teaching those practices to our clients to our families whatever we can prevent an awful lot of disease and associated health issues you know we can reduce stress we can perform optimally every day and we can wake up joyful and learn to live a balanced happy life you know 
life is we're never going to be happy all the time we need those contrasts but we can live the best version of our life possible if we can apply so many of those principles on a day-to-day -day basis and i feel that that's our objective that's our job that's our very, mission isn't it very beautifully very said yeah. yeah and also when we are talking about ayurveda for today i think because we are so overstressed by media and you know the self-image and the, the thing about being successful and pressure we really need to have more confidence Right. So when we are talking about modern, you know, either for the modern lifestyle, we are talking about personality development. We are talking about self-confidence and, uh, you know, finding your purpose in your life, what makes you happy and what makes you joyful rather than just the Ayurvedic principle. Obviously, Ayurvedic principles are beautiful and are the heartbeat of Ayurveda. It's just the difference in the language. Right. Yes. Yes. And, you know, we live a different pace of life. And, I, you know, I often think this, I know it's a funny analogy, but I do a lot of long distance walking. I walk Caminos and it's wonderful because you walk hundreds of miles. You walk in the footsteps of maybe pilgrims have walked for thousands of years. And a little amusing thing in the back of my head always runs. If I see a train go past or a bus, I think to myself, do you know what? If that had been there when the pilgrims are around, they'd have got on that bus. And I think that's <laughs> the same thing with us. We have different technologies, we have different techniques, we have different things available to us. We shouldn't ignore them because they weren't around at the time of traditional Ayurveda. We should utilize the best of what's available to us now. And integrate exactly, into yes. Modern Ayurveda, shouldn't we? I think it's really important to do that. Exactly. And we have a lot of tools, a lot of tools that are available to us. Right, coming back to this thing with the, you know, understanding Ayurveda for the modern lifestyle, look at us today. I mean, like I was just telling you about bulimia and my therapist here in India doesn't know what that means. Anorexia. They cannot imagine that, you know. And uh, let's see burnout. You know, it's been like when I went to Germany, maybe in, in one whole trip, I would see two or three clients who had burnout. And the last trip when I went before the COVID, I saw so many people whose energy was going down. They were burnout. Everybody said like it was the new thing. I have a burnout, right? Such things were not mentioned in the traditions. Hashimoto, I mean, like everybody is having Hashimoto nowadays and uh, depression, you know, depression in various forms about not feeling good about yourself with what's happening around us, a failing health and immune system, you know, so when we talk about Ayurveda for modern lifestyle, we put an emphasis on these things which are affecting the society more and uh, go deeper into Ayurveda to find out what can help because it's not written in the traditional books because those diseases were not there. No. Right. And isn't it very sad, Shivani, that we, we accept those lifestyle diseases as being natural? Definitely. We? we think that's normal. Yeah. We don't recognize that it's our lifestyle that's caused them. We don't go, hang on a minute. We didn't have that traditionally. We didn't have celiac disease because we ate different. You know, we didn't have all those things. If you go yeah, back, yeah. and in fact, even with celiac disease, we haven't got to go back too far. Yeah, go yeah. Back yeah. And I don't think you'd have found anyone that had an intolerance, you know, to right. our lifestyles. And the foods we're eating have changed so much, and that's had a huge effect. Do you know, we were just saying that, you know, this 24 7 lifestyle that we move further and closer closer to all the time you know and all that media all that technology you know it's it's so tempting it's so tempting it's so accessible and so we've worked our day our bodies are tired we should be tuning in to the you know the sleep bus comes at nine o'clock we should be tuning in and going to bed and what do we do instead you know we um work late into the night on our laptops we um, stimulate our nervous system, you know, our senses with Netflix at midnight, you know, watch right. the horror film, whatever it is. Or we're responding to our WhatsApp messages from time zones around the world at 2 a.m. in the morning because we're always on, always on. We're not stopping. And then we're going, why have I got these new diseases? Right. Why is this happening to me? Why am I suffering with all this? You know, technology has brought us some amazing you know, social media platforms. Here we are now talking to everybody. We couldn't do it without it. Exactly, it? yes. Yeah. We love it and they keep us connected but sadly you know research has shown that the extensive use of some of these platforms is actually causing other problems it's you know decreasing communication within families because what do we all do you see it when you're out in a restaurant don't you they're all sitting there on their screens and no one's talking to one another around the table exactly yes yeah. the way yeah. it's gone you know? um, yeah and it's also increasing for a lot of people feelings of loneliness 
anxiety, depression. Right, right. right. That's been difficult for people, you know. Exactly. Social media has robbed many of us of our self-confidence and our self-esteem. Yeah, you know, that's right. Because what do we do? We, we watch all these things on screen and it triggers comparisons with others. You know, right. it leaves many of us struggling with feelings of inadequacy and it raises doubts about our self-worth. Right. It affects our self-esteem, it affects our self-confidence, and that can lead to mental health issues right. in various degrees, you know, whether it's mild anxiety and depression or, or deeper problems that people Exactly, have. yes. And usually burnout, burnout. I'm coming across so many young people with yeah. burnout. It's happened in my own family. You know, the, yeah. the, living 24-7, London, New York, all that stuff, I've actually seen this firsthand, and it's, it's so hard to pull back from that, but luckily... I have those tools and have been able to use them with members of my own family, you know, with exactly, all yeah, my yeah. Music, it's been right. fabulous. For me exactly, yeah. It, you know, now we know we can't control some of those external stresses that find their way into our lives. But when we learn to tune into the signals that our bodies are sending us, and they're sending us signals all the time, Ayurveda helps us to recognize those signals. And then we can control how we manage our reaction to stress. Exactly. And then we learn to, you know, we can yeah. learn to calm the overactive mind. And yeah. this is where modern Ayurveda is different again from the traditional because psychology comes into it too. Exactly. It's, it's psychological. Yeah. It needs to. Because so many of our diseases we have now, you and I both know, they don't start in the body. They start with the mind, don't they? Right. They do. They the yes. Yeah. And with my international experience, that's what I saw in the West as well because... Uh, most of the diseases and for me, you know, we call it diabetic sampraapti. It's very important where how the person got the disease is always very interesting. And in the West, there's more and more with the mind. And when we come to the concept of modern Ayurveda, the solutions are specific. It exactly tells you what you need to do from all the aspects, from your mind, from your body. And that's where we are, you know, saving time by giving exactly what you need to do instead of learning the complete text and trying to know by yourself. And that's the art of consultancy or consultants where they can pick up the right solution for you based on, you know, what challenges you're facing. Now, Gail, you know, let's talk about the last part of our today's Thursday health talk because I'm having a look at my clock and, you know, we don't want to keep our viewers waiting. So let's talk about this last point about like, okay, so let's imagine a person in New York or in Paris and in a busy city. So... How can he really like, uh, how can one improve his health from wherever he is? Well, in many ways, can't we? I mean, it's, it's diet, we know it's lifestyle, it's mindset, it's, it's making time for ourselves. Self-care is so important, isn't it? You know, it to is. Have self-care. And you know, um, if we think about what would be the, the most important principles that we would need to bring in into our modern lifestyle, well, you know, we know diet is a very important one, don't we? Right. Uh, diet is important. That's something we really have to focus on. Is we all we all eat is something we're all doing. Right. Wherever we are in the world, we're all eating. So exactly. You know, these, yeah. These are generalizations, Shivani, really. You know, and in our Ayurveda, as you know, we would adapt these recommendations to suit the individual's constitution. But they're good general exactly. guidelines. You right. know, so if, when you're out in the world and you know, we've all got to eat and sometimes you're eating at your desk or whatever it is that's just how it works with our modern lifestyle just become aware of your eating habits you know and the cravings you've got you know that can tell us so much about what's going on in our body you need to tune into your inherent needs of your body you know notice when you're hungry notice when you're full what foods make you feel energized what foods make you feel heavy and sluggish and observe how your eating habits affect your mood and your sense of well-being i think we've become so disconnected from our food Right. The mind-body connection has just been broken, hasn't it? And so, right. so many of it. You know, right. And of course, avoiding your processed foods, minimizing right. your sugars, cut those red meats, the processed meats, the trans fats, you know, get your salt intake down if you can. And instead, choose those plant-based proteins, your nuts, legumes, beans, lentils, chickpeas, mung beans, quinoa, all those things, whole grains, you know, your barley, brown rice, buckwheat, all that stuff. Bring those into your life. And we can get them in most countries, in most parts of the world now when we go out to the deli or whatever to get things. And make sure you're eating, you know, all the colors of the rainbow in terms of your veggies, your fruit. Make sure you're getting all the nutrients you need. Know what you're eating. If you can know where it comes from, that's even better. Exactly. Yes. 
that exactly. really matters you know right. so when you go to the farmer's market on saturday or sunday that's the best thing to do don't get into the supermarket if you can avoid it so eat mindfully because right. we all know it's not just about what we're eating it's about how we're eating it how we're eating it where we're eating it that's all really important to our physical health too isn't it and we live such busy stressful lives we rush from task to task and i think many of us don't realize we hurry our meals and that causes our bodies to physically digest that stress. The mm -hmm. stresses of our diet are actually being consumed. And what does that do? It means that we eat too much and we end up with digestive issues. So, you know, it's really important that we don't do that. Exactly. exactly. That's, That's really, really good, good advice good because gut is your second brain. brain. And uh, with my observation and consultancy, I, I see, see that. that that the digestive system, the hormonal system and the neurological system, these systems are highly impact in today's time. And uh, here we have a comment that the modern Western people are, you know, look for quick, quick eat solutions and they don't take their life into their own hands. I mean, like this reminds me of what my mentor told me. Everybody needs the time and we should continue to be a good inspiration for the modern society and they will just follow maybe after when they hit the first wall because your body is definitely going to give you symptoms and diseases to tell you that you're not taking good care of it. So I guess, right. I was going to just say as well, you know, we know that Ayurveda has got the tools to help us grow into the best version of ourselves. You know, mm -hmm. we know if we look after our body, our body and mind work together. They're not separate entities. They work together. That's a settling experience for us all. And by eating well and by taking our time around, our, you know, what we're doing with our self-care, we can actually... Um, bring that neurological system into a state of balance. Can't exactly, we? We yes. We can balance our hormonal system. We right. can actually heal and, and, and balance our digestive system. We can do all those things, you know. Right. And also, with those tools that we have from Ayurveda, you know, we can have the self-confidence then. Right. When we, right. you know, we know that if we live well, we look better. Right. We look better, we feel better. We feel better, we attract better. We know that's how it works, you know. Exactly. We have, we have the self-confidence to step up and share our gifts. You know, it enables us to bring established, scientifically proven lifestyle practices into our hectic lives and restore balance. Why wouldn't we okay. do it? Right. Okay, okay Gail, Gail, I think like, like, you know, you have like Ayurveda describes the three pillars of health and in which you describe the first important change you need to bring in when you want to tune into Ayurveda is changing your food and seeing the impact. But, but the second one, which is very important, is your sleep. Oh, yes definitely <laughs> right like how good do you sleep because this is the problem with all the technology and overstimulation that the people are not having good sleep and for this i would like to tell how you can really make a better sleep with these three easy steps first of all what you really need to do in order to improve your sleep is to improve the quality of your thoughts when the thoughts are disturbing when the thoughts are stimulating when the thoughts are where you cannot control things right like when you're not really present where you are and your mind is always lost then your mind is most of the time hyperactive so i tell this easy exercise to my clients like set an alarm for two hours every two hours on your phone and just see what you're thinking after every two hours right and you can see that where your brain is and try to bring your brain to where you are you know like do something where you where, be where you are not where you can't be right so as you start to build up concentration in today's life many of your tasks are finished you know that explains the power of meditation you know before bed or you know or, or meditation just five minutes before you start your job so slow is the new fast right so so do that the second thing what really helps to improve the quality of sleep is having golden milk at night before bed. So it is really useful to have golden milk before sleeping because it's uh, really good to calm down your nerves. And uh, turmeric, golden milk, the major ingredient is turmeric. So turmeric internally soothes down all the irritated nerves. You know, turmeric has this property of reducing the inflammation. And the third thing what is really important is to bring a good sleep is to slow down the pace of the day rather than increasing it often in the morning 
And, you know, in the traditional lifestyle, we used to all get up in the morning and finish our work by the evening. But most of the people now I have seen start working at three or four and their work goes till 12, right? So if you want to sleep good, you should do all your major tasks by three or four and then slow down your pace, enjoy your relationships, you know, be with the people you love, speak to them, shut off your WhatsApp. And, you, you know, at times I'm guilty too of, you know, being in uh, this and to really calm down your mind here we have a you know recommendation of yoga nidra that is really good it's a meditation which helps you to sleep better but when you will when you're coming to ayurveda then after correcting your diet it's the time for sleep and the third one in ayurveda and i will ask gail about it Gail, yeah, this is because I think like you were recently when we were chatting, you told me you gave a lecture about this. So a question for you. So the third one is Brahmacharya. Ayurveda plays a lot of emphasis on Brahmacharya. And this is one of being the topic, you know, which when we talk in the West about sexuality or celibacy in the modern era, youngsters and many people are really like raising their hands, you know, like, okay. So what do you think? <laughs> How can, how can we bring this in the modern lifestyle about celibacy and brahmacharya in order to improve our health? It's really interesting, this one here. And I think traditional, you know, traditional Ayurveda speaks of celibacy, which is possibly the most difficult aspect to understand in modern life, particularly in the West. We just don't get it, do we? Because um, we don't. it's a very different society. No. I think what we have to remember here, when um, Ayurveda speaks of brahmacharya and, and celibacy, in past times, many of the students of Ayurveda and, and the sages who taught them had dedicated their lives to God. So Brahma, as most people know, was a god. So Brahma was a god and Charya was the active suffix, which meant to walk with. So Brahmacharya was to walk with God. I mean, that was right. the definition of what the word meant. So, and this involved building up and preserving high levels of vital, vital energy by not overindulging in all, all aspects of daily life now whether that was physically, mentally, or emotionally, so they didn't overeat, they didn't overstimulate themselves, and sex would have been a stimulation, um, and they didn't emotionally engage with arguing or fighting, or the, because they wanted to save that vital energy important. Then, for example, even now, if you think about it, some do choose to sacrifice a part of their life to live as a monk, live as a nun, live as a, a priest, it still happens now, and they choose to live very simple, austere, and celibate lives, so they can transmute the energy of sensory input into something else, which right. is principally their devotion to their God. Right. But for the average person who wants to live a healthy, modern Ayurvedic lifestyle, that might simply mean to remain faithful within, in a monogamous relationship. So another approach to that might be to use sexual energy, like all life energies, respectfully. respectfully. So not to waste our energy elsewhere. And that Beautiful. can mean that we respect, well, it does mean we respect ourselves and our partner when we're in a sexual relationship and we don't use others, you know, or we have don't have sex mindlessly. We have respect for ourselves, we have respect for others. I think that's how we have to view that brahmacharya now. Right. And in that way, we can allow sexuality and unnatural desires to be a part of a modern, healthy, loving relationship. Exactly. Which is very important, yeah. isn't yeah. it, for all our relationships. It's a part of, you know, it's, it makes us feel good. That connection is very important to us. So it's not that we have to remain celibate. It's just that we have to respect ourselves and others. Exactly. I love this description. What you said is like respectfully use the sexual energy respectfully. I'm not sure if Sharon is frozen or I have frozen. <laughs> we are good. To, can you hear me? Yes. That's amazing. Stay connected to your body. Yeah. Really. That's yeah. It's very important to be connected to your body, and uh, it is very important that. You are basically there understanding, you know, um, yourself, right? Like you are there understanding and you're interconnected. Gail? Okay. So I think Gail, I lost Gail, but she will join me. But we were, you know, finished with our chat show in any way. So this is amazing, you know, what we had today. The understanding about uh, Ayurveda and uh, how it really is different from the traditional Ayurveda, how we significantly stand as a different way of messaging and being more useful in the modern lifestyle of today. And I loved what Gail said about uh, sexuality, which is very important for health. 
and in this channel we are going to raise various topics which are very interesting for the common people to understand how to really apply you know the principles of ayurveda in today's lifestyle so thank you very much for joining me today as you can see that i think gail had some technical glitches and so she is locked out but i'm here and i'm so glad that you listen to our first episode and share and like and subscribe our channel because this is going to be full of information which is going to be useful thank you and bye bye